We're going to be discussing my new book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. Here it is. It's a nice, big, chunky, solid book. As you can see, lots and lots of hand examples, range images, etc. Solid book, 400 pages long. You know, just enough for you to get through in one long sitting of 32 hours. It's about how long it took me to read the thing out loud. <laughs> I just finished up the audiobook. That'll be up on Amazon any day now. So that's exciting to me. It's always nice whenever you spend a lot of time making a big project. And um, now you just got to pray people buy it. <laughs> they either will or they won't, right? Jordan says you bought it. Good. If you already got this book, if you enjoy it, please go and leave a review. That would go a long way to letting other people know it's a, re it's a decent book at least. I think it's a really good book. I learned a lot in the process of making it. Looks like Instagram decided to not start today. Today we will be discussing my newest book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. You can get it at pokercoaching.com slash tough, by the way, so make sure you check that out. Today, I'm going to answer whatever questions you have pertaining to the book, and if you all don't have any questions, we're just going to walk right through some of my thoughts as I you know, go through the table of contents and talk about things that I learned in the process of this. Jordan said he had to pause a poker coaching premium class for a little coffee. Well, hello. Welcome. Good morning. Glad to make it live. I'm glad you're here. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to be discussing... My newest book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. If you're watching this on Instagram, it's going to be better if you go to youtube.com slash pokercoaching or twitch.tv slash Jonathan Little. They'll be able to see my screen. Instagram doesn't let me do that. They make it difficult. Look, I have to use, I have to use this big device over here to um, show off Instagram. You see? See that? It's not optimal. But, you know, I know some people love their gram. If you love the grams, you got to... Got to stay on it. All right. So first things first. If you all have any questions about the book, type them in. I'm happy to answer them. I did work with a wonderful cast of characters for this book. Many, many world-class pros. Many, many world-class managers of poker players, which I don't think some people fully comprehend how rare of a skill that is and how vital of a skill that is. This book is powered by Pokar. What is Pokar? Pokar is a poker backing company that I'm an advisor for. It's run by Alex Carr right here in the corner. See him? Alex Carr and uh, Rob Tenyon also does a ton of the management, as, done be, as does Ben Shuster. These are all world-class players who also are very good at helping other players become the best that they can possibly be. How do you buy this book? Go to pokercoaching.com slash tough. There's a link right down here below. Also, you can um, buy it on Amazon. Just search it on Amazon. It'll come right up. Can you purchase this book on Amazon? This book has been out for about four or five months now. Maybe three or four months. I don't know. It's relatively new. All right. Can we talk about this Negranu Heads Up match? No. And I'll tell you why. Because I already have loads of content about that at youtube.com slash poker coaching. So make sure you check that out. And I'll be going through a hand every other day or so for a while. How do you play or use a good strategy when the players at your table are not? They could have anything. Well, that's great that they could have anything because if they have 100% of hands and you have the top 20% of hands, you're going to demolish them. It's easy to win when your opponents play junk. Just make sure you don't pay them off. Is this book a good book to help you get back in the swing of things if you've been out of poker for a while? Absolutely. Assuming you are already a pretty decent poker player, this book will get you up to speed. All right, let's go through some of the chapters here. To GTO or not GTO? That is the question by Rob Tinian. Rob Tinian has won the Sunday Million two times. Pretty uh, rare feat. Um, I've only been lucky enough to chop it once. <laughs> he's won it twice. Um, and also he's been a manager of Pokar for many years. Now he started off small stakes player, got backed by Pokar. Ran it up, ran it up, ran it up, ran it up. Won all the money. Now, Mostly manages players and just plays high stakes tournaments on Sunday. Kind of like what I do, except for I have pokercoaching.com. They have Pokar. Pokar is a backing company. It doesn't accept Americans as far as I know. You need to be able to play a lot of volume online, or at least decent volume online. Um, 
they're not trying to back people who want to splash around and get lucky. You already have to be a decent poker player to get backed by them. Because it turns out there's a lot of pretty decent poker players already. Whenever you go to a major backing company looking to get backed, recognize they're often very sophisticated. They are actually printing money long term. And they do that by starting off with reasonable players to begin with. They're not trying to raise people from knowing nothing at poker. They're trying to take people who are already pretty decent at poker. Actually, a decent amount of poker coaching students have become poker backies. Uh, poker has a private training site featuring content by a lot of these people. Notice some of these people are poker coaching coaches. Two of their main content producers. We have um, Bert Stevens, Draft Ganger, and also Michael Acevedo. They, um, I found them on Pokar, right? I mean, I, I love their content a lot. And now they make content for poker coaching. So I'm very, very happy about that. Um, okay, so to GTO or not GTO, the answer is you need to know how to play fundamentally sound strategies, but you need to know how to adjust away from them to take advantage of what your opponents do incorrectly. If you just think you're going to play like a solver in no limit hold'em tournaments or cash games today, you're not going to make as much money as you could if you paid attention and took advantage of your opponent's mistakes. So I want to talk about this Doug Polk now Negroni match. This is a good example, right? Doug Polk basically approached this saying, I'm going to try to play as close to GTO as I can. And so far, it seems like he's playing, you know, reasonably close to it, maybe over bluffing a little bit, but playing reasonably close to GTO. And that's going to result in bits of equity being pushed his direction over and over. And now you may say, oh, can Daniel Negreanu exploit him? The thing is, is that if Polk is playing close to GTO, the answer is just no. I mean, you can try. You can maybe try to trap him and let him over bluff. But like, it's not like he's insanely over bluffing or doing anything ridiculously out of line. Everything he's doing seems to be at least somewhat reasonable according to the solver. And if that's the case, no, you can't really exploit him. You can't do anything about that. You're just kind of screwed. <laughs> and then the next question becomes, should Polk try to exploit Negranu? Initially, he probably is not going to know what Negranu does wrong, right? So if you don't know what your opponent's going to do wrong, you need to play with him for a while, get some data, whether it be you know with a heads-up display, which I don't think they're using, or just by paying attention and taking notes, right? You need to essentially be able to figure out what your opponent does wrong. But if you don't know what they're going to do wrong, you can guess, or you can just play GTO, print your money, and then eventually... Um, adjust and take advantage of it, right? So this is a scenario where I think Polk may start adjusting at some point, or he just may just keep playing a strategy. Turns out, <laughs> poker's nice when you can just sit down, play a strategy, you know you're playing better than your opponents, and you're going to crush them, and that's it. It's nice. It's nice to know that, and that's sort of the um, guarantee GTO gives you. Now, of course, Polk may not want to play specifically GTO, because he actually has all these side bets that require him to win the match way more often than not. Which means he may need to learn to extract additional value more than GTO would give him. Like, let's say we know the GTO strategy is going to give him five big blinds for 100 hands. That's not enough. If he gets five big blinds for 100 hands, on average, he's going to lose his challenge. Well, lose his side bets on four to one, five to one, whatever he got. So he may actually have to do better than GTO. Really, the question is in this scenario, how bad is Negranu? And we don't know yet because we haven't played all that many hands. I am very confident Negranu is keeping track of how he is faring. Um, I've talked to a few people who have talked to him, and um, I'm not going to give away any inside information here. But you need to be aware of how you are faring against your opponent. And it's actually... The, uh, the match is... The way it's set up with all the side bets is set up such that Negranu just has to not get crushed. And he's going to profit long run, even if he loses the challenge on average, right? Because he needs to win one in five times or something like that. And that's going to essentially result in him just not having to get crushed. And if he can just not get crushed, he'll profit. Polk, though, has to just absolutely crush him, which is actually kind of difficult to do, unless your opponent's terrible, right? So to GTO or not GTO, Negranu should essentially be doing his best to try to um, play close to GTO. That way it's roughly a coin flip, right? Problem is he probably doesn't know how because it's very difficult to do. There's a hand I reviewed that will be going up today or tomorrow where Polk made a play where he used a big overbet in a spot where I'm not sure Negranu would have. And if you look at the solver, it says you should overbet every time. Basically, Polk played the hand perfectly by the solver in a spot where I think a lot of people, probably 95% of poker players, would not have played the hand by the solver. Which shows that he's a very, very good heads-up player, right? 
and that's going to result in him having a reasonable edge in the match. Anyway, to GTO or not GTO, you should GTO until you know what your opponents do wrong, either by knowing what your specific opponent does wrong or you know what the general player pool does wrong. Next, we have two chapters by Matt Brown and Ben Shuster that are complementary to each other. Um, they're basically ideas to ensure that you get out of the small stakes ASAP into the middle stakes, right? This is a, um, If you're playing the small stakes games, you can have a decent edge, but you don't actually make a ton of money per game. Let's say you're playing $10 buy-in tournaments, you have 50% ROI. It's a good ROI, but you're making five bucks per game. You're not gonna get rich playing $5 per game unless you're putting in massive volume. And the problem is in multi-table tournaments, you can't really put in massive volume like, I mean, if you're playing a lot, you may play, what, 50 tournaments a day? 50 is a lot, which would be 50 times 5 is 250 bucks a day, which is, like, fine money, but you're not going to get rich off of it. And for that reason, you want to make sure you crush the small stakes games, move up, and get to the high stakes games. So these are essentially tips for getting out of those games, mainly just ways to exploit the players and what they do incorrectly. Um... Things that I've talked about a lot on, on YouTube and the free content to some extent. This stuff's not like super rocket science or anything. Um, like whenever you bet the river, when they raise you, you should fold, right? That's something you should do on the passive side that is very, very straightforward, right? So this is a scenario where um, that, that's a lot of what is being talked about here. Just basic things that you need to make sure you understand to beat the weak players. Toby says, so much stuff to memorize according to the solver. I actually disagree. There's not much to memorize. There's a lot to understand, though. You need to understand why the solver does what it does so that you can then somewhat replicate it. And that is difficult to do, but not impossible. I have a tournament course coming out soon. We actually go through and break down a lot of what the solver does and develop systems in order to allow you to replicate what the solver does in-game whenever you're playing. All right, next. Here we have chapter by me, adjusting your preflop strategy. This is discussing getting away from GTO strategies to take advantage of whatever your opponents do incorrectly. And again, sometimes they do a lot incorrectly, sometimes they don't, right? This is a section where, I mean, just to give you some examples here, let's see, where is this chapter? We discuss things like key stats, right? VPIP, preflop raise, adjusting accordingly. We discuss um, finding leaks in your opponent's game based on how often they are playing and just off common stats, right? VPIP, preflop raise, three bet, fold big blind to steal, etc. Whenever I am playing online, wherever you watch me streaming, it's I'm not using some super advanced heads up display, right? It's relatively few stats I'm using, but you can use those stats to extrapolate your opponent's strategy and that allows you to adjust. So I go through that a ton, give you some examples. Is poker dead when solvers are needed to beat it? Solvers are not needed to beat it yet. Well, depends on what game you're playing. If you're playing an easy game, then yeah, you got to play by the solver. Like if you're playing satellites or sit and goes or limit hold'em, you're already playing by the solver. But no limit hold'em is a difficult game. I played at Harris New Orleans many times. You took your bankroll from 130k to 86,000 in less than a month. Well, congrats, you have 86K. You feel like trash now. <laughs> um, there's, there's a saying, the easiest way to have a million or to make a million bucks is to start with 100 million and lose it all. Is there a virtual copy of the book you can buy? Yes. There's this thing called Amazon.com. They have a thing called a Kindle. You can download a the, the Kindle app on basically every device available, your phone, your iPad, whatever. You can read it on the internet. So yes. You can also download a PDF if you want an old school PDF. All right, next. Two chapters that are complementary to each other here. Actually, three to some extent. When to continuation bets, defending against continuation bets, and sa shallow stacked big blind defense. Three very good chapters. They're concise guides on how to continuation bet, defend against continuation bets um, in general when you're out of position and also shallow stacked big blind defense, right? These three chapters, two of them are by John Van Fleet. His name's Ape Styles online, one of the biggest winners online. I don't know how much he's cash for at this point, but he has, he's been around poker for forever and is thought to be the biggest, if not, well, one of the biggest, if not the biggest winners online. I've learned a lot from watching his content on poker and um, I think he's very good at poker, right? So um, he discusses his general strategies for continuation betting. Here's the chapter, when to continuation bet. 
And he goes through, like, ideas of when sh is it fine to just bet small and frequently. As we see, chapter right at the top of the page, you can't see this, it says betting frequently. You should be betting frequently, right? And then he goes through a few adjustments, goes through some pile solver examples of how to play your range. Um, yeah, goes through, goes through various scenarios. And this goes a long way to helping you understand how to play as a continuation better. And then he goes through the more difficult scenario. Um, he discusses like basic big, big blind defending ranges, discusses how to defend less as you're facing bigger raise sizes, right? Discusses equity realization. Here's an equity realization chart for a specific scenario. More equity realization charts just so that you can see how well you're realizing your equity. Talks about defending with a capped range where you call it a bunch of junk, right? And then he goes through a bunch of hand examples. And I think that that is very, very useful. Then we have a chapter by Alexandre Mantovani. His name's Cavalito online. You may know him. He's a popular, pretty sure Brazilian. Is he Brazilian? Pretty sure he's Brazilian. Um, very, very world-class player. He has another chapter in the book as well, but this is on defending the big blind shallow stack, which is something a lot of people have a difficult time doing. They think their only play is to just go all in pre-flop, and that is a big, big mistake. You are allowed to call, and you are allowed to play post-flop, and you're even allowed to check raise small post-flop. You are allowed to do that type of thing. You're allowed to get in there and battle. All right, let's see if you have any questions. Only 26 likes. Oh, don't worry, people don't like this kind of content. If you all like this kind of content, click like so we know it. Also, check out this book. Go buy it, pokercoaching.com slash tough. I'll tell you what, if you like this book, if you enjoyed it, write what your favorite author or chapter was in the comments below so that I know what kind of content you all like. Because, I mean, you all can type it in the chat, but it, it'll be a bit of a mess. If you all type it in the comments below on YouTube, that would be very helpful to me. So take a second and do that. I'd appreciate it. This book is actually bigger than regular books. This is my, I think, third biggest book. We have a, a two 500-page books, and this is about 400 pages. What is the biggest tournament prize I've ever won? There's a site called Hinden Mob or Global Poker Index. You can actually look that up. Type any poker player's name and poker, and it'll typically come right up. I've won a million dollars twice. Um, online, my biggest score, I think, was 320K. That was a long time ago, though. In a $1,000 tournament. Like we said, we chopped the Sunday Million, chopped the big full tilt tournament back in the day. Thought I was going to have a big score this weekend. Only cash for about 60000 bucks this weekend. Solid score, solid score, but not amazing. Yeah, you know, look, you have a solid profitable, profitable Sunday, you've got to be happy. But, um, you know, you know. Uh, let's see, your friend won a turn for 3000 bucks last night. Congrats. Is there a link to buy the book on poker coaching? No, you cannot buy the book on poker coaching. You can get it through the publisher or through Amazon. The multi-way chapter that I made is the one that you like the best. Well, thank you. So yes, let's talk about this chapter here. Navigating multi-way pots. This is something that has not actually been discussed by many poker players whatsoever. Why, you may ask? Because a lot of poker players study using GTO solvers. Now, for the longest time, there actually was not a GTO solver. Who's that angry looking, looking human right there? <laughs> For the longest time, there was no solver, therefore no one made content about it. I have been saying for the longest time that you need to play pretty tight in multi-way pause because someone's like to have something, or someone's likely to have something. So I went through about 20 hand, 25 hand examples where I discuss how to play multi-way pots. And Essentially, you need to not overvalue your hands. It's really, really easy to overvalue top pair bad kicker, middle pair good kicker, marginal draws, right? This is a spot that a lot of people screw up, and it's especially tough when you're playing small stakes games against wide ranges. I know a lot of you effectively complain that your opponents play poorly, but I mean, you should be happy to get to play multi-way pots with them. You just have to play the multi-way pots well. You have to understand that hands like aces whenever seven people see the flop and it comes jack 10 seven is not the nuts. It could be a check fold, which is um, something a lot of people are not aware of. Let's see. Do I plan on making more Polk Negranu hands? Yes, they're gonna be coming out every two days or so until they're done playing most likely. 320K and a thousand buy-in? Yep, big tournament. 
back in the day, they had these things on full tilt, right? But when they when they knew they were going to close, they decided to start running tournaments where you could enter six times at the same time right off the bat. So you could sit down, play six entries of the thousand dollar tournament right at the start. So you could six table the thousand dollar buy in tournament. So basically, every good player got to play it six times. <laughs> and funny enough, in that tournament I took second place in, um, a guy Chris Mormon took third. He's pretty well known, and also one of my friends. Um, he took first and also ninth. When you made it to the final table with two different stacks still in, they combined them. So he basically final table two times, <laughs> which is pretty fun. Can Munker Solver handle multi-way pots? That's the whole, yes, Munker Solver can handle multi-way pots. That's essentially the whole point of it. Should you get comfortable with various programs? Yes, you should. The best way to get into GTO, read the book, Modern Poker Theory. Then go to pokercoaching.com and watch Michael Acevedo's content. Norfear says that you're about halfway through. You've highlighted almost all of Ben Shuster's passive exploits. Yeah, very, very good content for that. Should a new learner start with this book or others? You should probably start with um, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Definitely check that out. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em is a very, very good starting place. All right, next chapter I learned a lot from. Leading Turns from the Big Blind by Rich Hoadley. Want me to spoil this for you? Here's Rich. Very, very strong player. One of the best poker coaches I have ever learned from. He is a very, very solid player. Well, solid meaning world-class thinker and also plays at a very, very high level. Most common spots to lead the turn. As you see, we're about to go through them right here at the bottom of the page. Can you see it? We go through low four-card straight turns. When the turn... Brings four to a low card straight, you should be leading a ton, perhaps with your entire range. Next, when the middle card pairs, or when the bottom card pairs, especially when it's a lot of your range, like say hijack raises you call the big blind, becomes queen seven three, you have a decent amount of sevens and threes in your range when you check call their flop bet, right? Therefore, when the turn pairs the seven or the three, you get to lead a decent amount of the time, usually with a lot of gut shots, backdoor flush draws, um, and threes and or whatever the trips is. Next, low three card straight turns such as eight six two five or jack eight six five. These are very very good turns to lead as well. Um, we discussed when to use a small bet versus when to use a big bet. Typically, as you're betting more frequently, you're going to be using a smaller bet. When you're betting less frequently, you're going to be betting a bigger bet. We go through population errors and exploits, loads and loads of solver images, right? Would you all believe we actually had to, we had to make all these solver images by hand? Look at that image. I didn't make it. My publisher made it. He had to go through and make literally every single one of these by hand. There was no way to export PyoSolver into an image that worked right. What a pain, huh? The work we go through for all of you. This is another book I thought would take like six months to make. It took about two years. Go figure. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. You know that your question was uncomfortable. I tend to not get too uncomfortable. If I don't see your question, I don't answer it. That's how it goes. You want to drop me some love? Well, thank you. If you enjoy this, click like, click subscribe. Leave a review for the book. I would appreciate it. All right. What's next? Um, making an opponent different to calling or folding. This is a short chapter by Alex Carr discussing the value of polarized strategies, discussing bet size percentages, or uh, minimum defense frequency compared to your bet percentage, and structuring your range appropriately such that you are unexploitable. This is important because we're going to get to the turn in the river here and you need to make sure that you are using strategies where you are essentially um, developing a fundamentally sound strategy going to the river. How many tournaments do I play on average each week? When I play on Sundays, it depends on exactly which sites and whatnot, but eh, you know, 20, 30, something like that. Not a ton. You don't like that the content in each of your book is similar. Well, hate to break it to you, but um, poker is a game that is continuously evolving. Also, people are continuously getting better. I got better in the process of writing this book. But that's how it goes, right? You have to realize that the first tournament book I wrote a long time ago and the most recent book I made, um, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, that's sort of a concise guide, actually has relatively similar content, except... Now we have a good, fundamentally sound framework 
for why we were doing what we were doing. And some of the stuff that I was doing wrong back then are things that were just straight up player exploits or player pool exploits, I realize does not work today, right? So you have to understand that poker is not a game where you can just write run one book. We're not doing physics here. Well, to be fair, physics gets upgraded too, right? Um, we're not we're not doing basic arithmetic where two plus two always equals four. Hate to break it to you, that's not what we're doing. If that's what you're looking for, there's a game called Tic Tac Toe that I recommend because it is a game that is not going to evolve all that much in the future, unless of course they change the rules. Do you have any videos on ICMIs or an equal app? Yeah. Search pokercoaching.com, look up on YouTube, etc. When am I going to stream again? I don't know. I've been busy. Been busy recording for all of you. If I would start poker now, what would I do? I would play small stakes tournaments and play all the time. All right, next chapter by Louise. Don't be afraid to go for it. So many people are chickens. They get, find themselves on the river. They get to the river. They don't know what to do. And then they chicken out. Did you say the mastering book is not good anymore? That is not what I said, Michael. If it is, I didn't mean it. The first book I made 10 years ago is a little bit outdated. Fortunately for all of you, I am going back and updating it. Someone says here, you wish I would just go back and remake the old book. You have to realize there's many aspects to poker, right? There's no limit cash games. There's tournaments. Hate to break it to you. If you want a book on tournaments, it's got to be like 500 pages long if you want it to be any good. It can't be... 80 pages if it's going to be in depth, right? I think a lot of people just really want the most simple, concise thing. And I hate to break it, just, that's just not how it works. It's not how it works. If I was to take all of the poker knowledge I have and make a giant book out of it that is like everything I knew, it'd probably be like literally 4,000 pages. And hey, look, turn around. There's about 4,000 pages up there on the, on, the, on the bookshelf, right? That's how it goes. How much do you make in the micro stakes? I haven't played the micro stakes in a very, very long time. That said, I do know my win rate, EV big blind per hundred in um, like $50 buy in tournaments, which is like the lowest I'll even consider playing online. Something like 12 big blinds per hundred, which is like very, very good in those games. High stakes games, the toughest games, it's usually something like four or five EV big blind per hundred. I haven't played micro stakes online in a very, very, very long time. That said, I'm going to be having to quarantine after I come back from Vegas in a few days. So I may actually spend a day Grinding out the small stakes, micro stakes. I guess we'll see. Some of you said you wanted content pertaining to that. Next chapter. Again, by Chip Spool. Good punt or bad punt? I made the mistake of earlier saying he's a, little bit, he's a solid player. He's not a solid player. He'll, he'll get after it. He basically goes through various scenarios and runs it through the solver and shows if his punts were good or bad. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. Essentially, was he over bluffing? And um, he goes through six or eight or ten hands here. How many hands does it go through? It's a lot of them. Eight. Goes through eight hands, pre-flop all the way to the river, going through the solver on every betting round, explaining when he should be bluffing, when he should not be bluffing, and adjusting and accordingly. Uh, and adjusting accordingly. Why are you quarantining when you come back from Vegas? Because that is the responsible thing to do. Only for five days. From what I understand, I know a few hedge fund managers who are heavily knowledge or very knowledgeable about the virus and whatnot and the responsible things to do and they say the responsible thing to do when you travel to a high risk area like las vegas is is to quarantine for five days at home get a test then you should be good to go um if you want to be a little more aggressive come back home quarantine for three days then then get a test but there's still a chance that you may have it and may test negative even you knew JL doesn't play the micros. Come on, bro. Yeah. Is the audiobook of this out yet? It's going to be out very soon. It's recorded. It's done. It's waiting on Amazon to approve it. As soon as it's up, I'll, I'll post about it on Twitter. All right. What am I going to be playing in Vegas? It's a secret. Some things you're not supposed to announce until after they happen. All right. Next chapter. I learned the most in this book from this chapter. Mastering ICM by Vlada Stojanovic. You all may not know Vlada. In 2019, I'm going to read his bio. He final tabled the $10,000 Party Poker Millions in Rio and also took third place in the $1,000 Scoop Tournament. That's what he had done previously. But I had watched some of his videos, and I knew this guy was a sicko. And you know what happened? Right as soon as we released this book, like the week we released it, he won a million and a half dollars in the $10,000 buying Stadium Series. Outright won a million and a half bucks online the week this book came out. 
Also, Ape Styles and John Van Fleet both had 500k scores as well, so that was pretty cool. Um, so anyway, I'd seen a few of a lot of videos on Pokar, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy's sick, and had to have him write for the write for the book, and um, it's great. So he did, goes through various ICM adjustments, discussing how to adjust your play preflop, which I already knew. I already knew most of this preflop stuff pretty well, um, like because I mean I've studied. You studied ICM spots a ton back as a kid. But then we get to the chap the section on defending the big blind when deep stacked. Playing deep stacked post flop in ICM scenarios is tough. It's very, very tough. It's difficult to know how to navigate these scenarios, especially with a medium stack. And to be fair, I, I didn't necessarily know what I was doing. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty good at these things, right? Like, there are these spots right here where, take a look at this. You see this chart here in red? This is a spot where, as the big stack, someone raises, you defend the big blind as a big stack. We get a low flop. You're supposed to be, like, leading every single time. GTO strategy is to essentially put your opponent in a bluff-catching scenario where they cannot profitably bluff-catch because their risk premium by the river is going to be gigantic. It's going to be gigantic. And... Essentially, they need an extra 20 or 30% equity to call on the river, and if your range is anywhere near balanced, even if it's super bluff heavy, they're still going to have to fold everything, assuming they know what they're doing. And if they decide to call off super wide, well, yeah, they're punting, but it's bad for you. So you have to make sure you understand your opponent's strategies. I'm going to learn how to pronounce a, Ser a Serbian name here. Stojanovic. Stojanovic. Vladis Stojanovic. Thank you. Could you see this as a video? No, we're not going to see this as a video. You've asked the same question four days in a row. Well, feel free to leave, Adam. If you don't like it, I mean, I don't know. Type in the question. I, I answer most of the questions that come in. I love when people get frustrated if I don't answer a question. You see that we've literally had hundreds of people type in stuff here. And I'm trying to read a book to you at the same time as this. If you don't like it, leave. I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be offended. Also, if you don't see your question pop up here, it means I didn't see it. I'm like, look, where is this guy's question? Look, out, look, there's literally nothing from Facebook posted. Here's something. This is by Louis Philippe. Oh. Let's see. He posted a long time ago and just now complaining. Look, if I miss it, you know I miss it, right? Look at this. Look at where is this question? Where is this question? It's not even on here. Oh, here it is. Oh, Jesus. Way back. You, you asked this question a long time ago and you're getting mad now. Come on, man. Get over it. Let's see. Do you have sections in the upcoming tournament course on 25 to 40 big blind poker? Of course we do. In fact, the vast majority of the content is 40 big blind content and 20 big blind content. Okay? Is that all that hard? Is that all that hard? Look, it's going to be out in like a week. Just be patient. It's coming out. If you're impatient... Doing group communal things like this may not be for you because I'm not here to service exactly you. I'm here to service all of the people here, right? To the best of my ability, within reason. Where do you buy this Bible? Link down below, pokercoaching.com slash tough. Is there a sit-and-go book in the works? No, look, Greg, I, I tell people this all the time. I know some people like sit-and-goes. I know they work very well with a lot of people's lives where you want to sit down and play for an hour. But sit-and-goes are not a great way to make money. They're just not. They're a good way to learn ICM strategies, but they're just not a good way to make money. And the reason they're not a good way to make money is because your edge is going to be very small and you cannot, um, you can't really put in substantial volume anymore, at the, even at the medium stakes. So um, I, I would generally not recommend you play those games. And I try to push my students into games that I think are going to be good for them long term, not games that may make them a little bit of money in the short term. Okay? Are cash games the best way to grow in bankroll initially? I mean, they're certainly the best way to have consistent income. Next, another chapter I learned a lot from. After this chapter, I had to hire Bert Stevens as a coach for poker or for poker coaching. Bert Stevens is draft ganger online, number one or number one player in the world in tournaments a year or two ago. He's getting back into the grind now. Turns out when people get rich, they take a little bit of time off and spend their money and enjoy life. Then they're like, oh man, I should go play some more poker. So anyway, now Draft is grinding hard again. He actually won a $10,000 buy-in tournament on GG a week or two ago for about 400000 bucks. He reviewed it with Michael Acevedo. 
on pokercoaching.com. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, definitely check that out. I watched the whole thing. I learned a lot. Turns out when you're watching two of the best players in the world discuss high stakes scenarios, you learn a ton. So anyway, this chapter is about medium stacked final table strategies. A very, 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 very tough spot to play. And he discusses his limping strategies, which is something that, you know, I, I don't really do a whole lot of limping from the medium positions. There it is. Take a screenshot. Limping strategy from a particular spot, raising the best hands and the worst hands, limping a lot of stuff in the middle. Because essentially you don't want to play big pots, like ever, right? So you should be doing a lot of limping as the medium stack. And so essentially he goes through like 50 hands where he is explaining how he uses his strategy to make deep runs at the final table, whereas other people don't. Wasn't this book released in August? It was, but a lot of you were talking about it. So I figured I'd uh, give everyone a chance to answer, their, to ask their questions. There's a little baby down there. All right. Is this an edited version? I'm not sure what you mean. Whenever you make a book like this, you're going to release... I'll tell you how they... Uh, you want a little uh, lesson in book publishing? At least how we do it. We make this book. We print it. We print like... 1,500 copies, not very many. We sell 1,500 copies. People are going to come back saying that um, there are little like errors in it, right? We found, I don't know, 15 typos or 20 typos in the book. So then we go back, we edit it, we update the PDF immediately, if you, or the Kindle book immediately, and then we um, reprint the book, and then we print like 10,000 of them. And that way, um, that way it, it's, it's in good shape. Unfortunately, the first people who... Um, Read a book, often get a slightly, slightly, slightly dirty version. I do my best to have a few of my students read through the book ahead of time to find any issues, ask for clarifications, etc. A lot of you helped with this book. I know it was a big undertaking, but um, is this edited? The, the answer is essentially yes. Every time we edit things, we every time we find flaws, we fix it, of course. But is this like a new book? No, it's not a new book. This book came out just a few months ago. Right? I mean, is that new? It came out a few months ago. What do you want from me? All right, next chapter. PKO Strategies by Alexandre Montovani, the PKO tournament expert. He won a $1,000 PKO tournament recently. Took second in 2K recently. One of the biggest fields ever in PKO tournaments. $2,000 buy-in. And um, I learned a lot from this. I used to actually shy away from the PKO tournaments because I didn't know how to calculate the bounties. But... He actually provided a PKO Bounty Calculator for everyone. If you get this book, you can get the PKO Bounty Calculator. If you're a Poker Coaching member, PKO Bounty Calculator is right there for you in the tools. So make sure you get that. Use that. You don't have to be afraid of PKO tournaments. Get in there and crush it. Funny enough, tournament I won the other day. 2,000 person tournament. PKO tournament. Collected all the bounties in the end. Shippity doo dah. Is this available as an ebook? It is. It's on Amazon. You can get it on, like anywhere. Anywhere you can get books, you can get this book. So anyway, I learned a lot from this chapter. Actually, I wrote this chapter and was in the process of writing this chapter in um, January, my last live tournament this year that I played at um, Nottingham and at Dust Till Dawn. And there was a, P a PKO series going on on Poker Stars or Party Poker, one of the sites then. And I normally wouldn't have played it, but I decided to load it up and I won like 60,000 bucks that week. <laughs> It was a very, very good week, all from PKO tournaments, all from using his calculator. He goes through and discusses um, various ways to calculate the bounties, the bounties value, et cetera, et cetera. You think someone can be an elite high stakes pro without understanding GTO? Um, I think anyone who doesn't have some sort of fundamental understanding of, PK, of GTO probably is not going to win. That said, a lot of people don't necessarily know why they're doing what they are doing, and they're going to be playing pretty close to right. Um, I mean, I'm a good example of this. Back when I wrote my first book a long time ago, I didn't know what I was doing and why. Thomas, 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 let me come, let come say hello. Come say hello. Hey, can you say hello? Are you happy? Can you say happy, Thomas? Yeah, that's a little button I don't want you to push. There's a button over there that raises up the desk. What's your name? Hey, where's Daddy? Yeah. Hey, where's Daddy's head? Yeah, where's Daddy's mouth? Where's Thomas's head? Where's your head? Yeah, you're so smart. Where's your Where's your belly? Oh, there it is! There it is! <laughs> your belly button. 
All right. I'm glad that you're here. Oh, that's my belly. Don't play on my belly. Can you can you say hello? Hello. Yes, you're a good boy. All right, you're going. Okay. Bye. Love you. See you. All right, Donna. Oh, go, go, go. You gotta go. You gotta go. You gotta go. Bye, bye. Miss you. Hey. All right. That baby will go through and tear up this whole office. He loves taking the shark and spiking it onto the ground. I'm shocked it's still alive. He loves pushing my buttons and raising my desk. And I have about 20 books on the floor here. He loves getting through the books and tearing them apart. He's a sweet baby, though. Uh, let's see. Should you assume your opponent does something particularly right or wrong? Um, depends on the games you're playing, right? Let's see. Do we have any additional content for PKO's tournaments coming out? Um, yes. We have some of that lined up. It should be coming out at some point in the near future. That said, really, there's not a ton to the game. Um, really, the main... The main issue with PKO tournaments, there's few, but the main issue is converting the bounties to ships. That's that's big task number one, but that's easy. Just use the calculator, right? And then big task number two is understanding like when you should shy away from calling in spots where you can collect a bounty. Because if you call and lose, then you won't be able to collect additional bounties nearly as easy. But like that's kind of intuitive as well. So really, I'm telling you, if you just read this chapter, it's not long, it's 30 pages or something. That's really all you need. I don't think you need to go super overboard in these scenarios. I mean, I'm sure you could go deep on ICM with bounty implications and whatnot. I'm sure that starts to get pretty convoluted. But um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. What's the name of this book? There's a link down here at the bottom. Look, pokercoaching.com slash tough. It's called Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. What cash games do you recommend to a player as half beginner? I have no clue what a half beginner is. Play small stakes. If you can't beat the tiny stakes, you can't beat the higher stakes. Next, we're moving on from online poker. We're starting to discuss a few other things. Now, strategies to crush live poker. This is my expertise. Um, so everybody else in this book is literally one of the best online players in the world. I'm trying to think, do any of these players play a ton live? I don't know if any of them play a ton live. Like, I know uh, Cavalito plays a lot live and crushes it. John Van Fleet does well, too, when he does play. He, like, never plays, but when he does, he wins. Um, I don't know if any of the other players play a lot live. I know Vlada's final table to 10k live as well. But I'm the live pro in the bunch. I'm the old man. So I discuss strategies where you should adjust away from playing online strategies to um, beat, the on beat the live games. I discuss how like live requires essentially more patience. I discuss things like um, various tells. I discuss how players typically play worse. I discuss the common leaks of live players, even decently good ones, right? Like playing too passively from the big blind. I discuss lacking volume. I discuss the idea of tournament life. Like online, tournament players don't care about their tournament life at all. Whereas live, a lot of players do, and you should exploit that. I discuss actually physically getting up and going to the casino, making the game good for everyone, etc., etc. Next, great chapter by Alex Carr. He is the head manager, main owner of Pokar. His job is to make the backers... I'm sorry, make the, make the backers and the backies. His job is to make the backies be the best players that they can possibly be. Okay? And um, he goes through a lot of things you can do to improve your life by 1% each day. And if you know how compounding interest works, if you get 1% better each day, you're going to crush it. And if you get 1% worse each day, because you're a degenerate, you're going to get crushed. Now, of course, it may not work exactly like this. But... If you do lots of little good things all the time and you develop habits that will allow you to, um, to thrive, you're, you're just going to succeed long term. It's close to impossible not to. And if you do things that essentially squander your life, you're going to have a really difficult time succeeding. How real is the section on how weed is really bad long term in game for you? That's the section. I, I mean, look, I have never been someone who does a lot of drugs. I've drank way more than my fair share of uh, alcohol in my life, and I would definitely tell you it's detrimental to your poker game. It should not be mixed at all. Um, other drugs, I think, are probably equally bad. I have not experimented with marijuana all that much. I've played poker high twice. It went very poorly. Um... That said, I've watched a few of my friends just completely squander their careers because 
They like smoking pot all the time. And um, I've watched a lot of other players who are not even all that great at poker who are millionaires because they show up and play great poker all the time. And um, there's a lot of value to just not, not wrecking yourself just because you're feeling like you need to do something. Um, it's, it's easy to take the easy way out, you know? And, like, it's easy to sit here and have a drink and mess around and play poker for me, for everybody probably. It's easy for a lot of people to smoke some pot and goof off and maybe win, maybe you lose. Yeah, drugs are bad, okay? Thank you for the honesty here. Yeah, I mean, look, I realize a lot of people, I, I mean, look, I don't know if people who, some people aren't going to like this, but I think drugs are something that's to some extent become, like, politicized or it's almost become something like religious to people where it's they're allowed to do what they want and they're, they're going to do what they want and they don't want to hear anyone telling them that they should not be doing something and i think this goes back to the idea that humans really hate the idea that what they may actually be doing is ruining their lives or making their lives worse or it's just a bad decision right and you know, forget drugs but take um Waking up at 10 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. Something very simple like that. What if you knew that if you woke up at 9 a.m. instead of 10 a.m., you'd be 1% more productive every day? Would you do it? Well, maybe, maybe not. But if you were presented with a load of data and you wanted to be the most productive person you could that says that if you woke up one hour earlier each day and went to bed one hour earlier each day, so same amount of sleep, that you'd be slightly more productive, perhaps because you are you are bothered less often by other people, maybe people's brains work slightly better with some circadian rhythm or something at 9 a.m. compared to 10 a.m., etc. What if you knew that would make you slightly better? Would you do it? Presented with the evidence, if you are a logical person, you'd start waking up at 9 a.m., right? Presented with evidence that drinking alcohol while you play poker is bad for you, would you stop drinking alcohol? Well, the answer is if you care about winning at poker, you will. And um, I think most of you care about winning at poker. And there's loads of evidence that say basically all the drugs are not great for you when it comes to playing poker. But I think weed's something a lot of people for some reason are very, very um, emotionally attached to, to some extent, where they like, it's almost like they, they view it as something they, they, I don't know, it's weird, it's weird. Like some people get really militant about it. Like in my mind, you should not really get all that militant about much of anything. There are some things you should get militant about, but the idea of, drinking alcohol or smoking pot or waking up at 9 a.m. compared to 10 a.m. Like, these are not things you should be getting militant about. You should be able to sit back, relax, and make logical, rational decisions. Anyway, there's a lot of data that says that um, drugs are not particularly great for you. Next, even big blind per 100 and table count. This goes through something we discussed here quite a bit about when you should be moving up, when you should not. And um, essentially how you go about putting in substantial volume to know if you're actually a good, successful winning player. And if you are, when you should move up and when you should move down. Next, Pump Up the Volume by Rob Tenyon. Rob Tenyon kind of started playing poker like I started playing poker, where he did this trajectory. Look at this. He played a bunch of tiny stakes games and slowly trickled up. Slowly, 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 slowly. And then he started playing higher stakes games and crushed it. All right. Let me read his stats to you here. In 2016, oh no, no, let's start, sorry. Let's go back, way back to 2012, okay? Long time ago. He played the average buy-in, average buy-in he played was $8. $8 average game, small stakes. But he played 10,000 of them that year. And he made $22,000. So he's playing tiny stakes games, basically no risk, and just consistently Prince money. Nice, solid upswing. You basically want $100,000 straight with no downswings whatsoever. It took him two years. He basically um, 3 x his buy-in in 2013. So he went from $8 average buy-in, grinded it up, went to $25 average buy-in, had about a 40% ROI across the board, and that allowed him to turn no money into you know $400,000 profit over the course of three years. A lot of value in just putting in the volume. And uh, Rob Tenyon is kind of like Jonathan Lillian, that he is a super grinder. And to be fair, he only grinded really hard for like three years. Um, which, you know, is fine, fine and reasonable. He grinded hard for three years, made 500,000 bucks. Played Sundays the next two years, made 500,000 bucks again. Um, probably ran a little bit hot, to be fair. When your graph is just like up, 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 up. I mean, you probably ran hot, right? But 
when you put in volume, you, if assuming you have a win rate, you're going to win. And that's what I did with sit and goes. Back in the day, I played 30,000 sit and goes a month. No, 3,000 sit and goes a month, about 30,000 a year. And I, I couldn't lose, it was impossible. Next, final chapter, how to become a successful back E. And this is good advice for how to become a successful manager of yourself as well. If you are not doing things like studying a ton, acting professionally, right? Avoiding negative EV activities. Drugs are talked about here again. Somebody else discussing, stay off the drugs. Um, if you're not making good decisions, you're gonna lose. And if you are making good decisions, you're gonna win. And um, this book essentially teaches you how to thrive in the tough games that exist today. So if you wanna win, you wanna crush the games, you wanna learn from the best players in the world, check out Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games. It's a good book. I learned a lot in it. You have to understand, some of my books I make now are not necessarily for me. They're more for you, like Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. That's not really a book for me because I already know all that stuff. It's a book for all of you. But this book was a book for me to learn. And I get to share it with all of you. That makes me happy. It makes me very, very happy. The high-level players make better folds than weak players. I mean, high-level players play better than their opponents in general. Let's see. Do you believe... I don't believe a lot. Do you believe that most good or great players memorize range charts? I don't think it's they necessarily memorize it. They just know it. Like, I don't think they're going through flashcards. I think they recognize the common scenarios that they're likely to be in, and they recognize what they should roughly be doing, and they're going to be plus or minus a hand or two. Fortunately, Chris, for you, get the poker coaching app. Look at the GTO charts. You can go through many, many, many common situations that you are very, very likely to encounter. Let me actually show you them on the site real quick. Let's see. Hmm, is this gonna work for me? Maybe it's not gonna work. Give me a second, give me a second. I don't think it's gonna work. Oh, this is so brutal. All right, give me a second, give me a second. I know what to do. We'll take a, take a smart selection screen capture. There we go. Beautiful, beautiful. Here's pokercoaching.com. This is my training site. Go to pokercoaching.com. Click on tools right here. Now we have downloadable preflop charts if you want those. Print them out, reference them all the time. And we also have the GTO preflop charts for various scenarios. We just have tournament charts at the moment with the ante. But you type in the blinds you have. Let's say we're playing 60 big blinds deep. Position is the cutoff. Let's say the um, we're facing a raise. Let's say whatever. Let's say low jack raises. And it goes through here and it tells you what you should do. And if you go through here and look at these spots over and over and over again, you're going to start to see the same patterns over and over and over again. You're going to see, let's say we're slightly deeper stacked. Range is going to change a little bit, right? A little bit more three betting with these lower type hands, right? Let's say we're playing 40 big blinds deep instead. As you see, a little bit less three betting with these ASEX suits, right? And so you start to see patterns over and over and over again. And this is available for Poker Coaching Premium members. If you go check it out, pokercoaching.com, that will be very, very useful for you. Just reference it over and 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 over, and over again. Reference the charts over and over and over again. What happened to the 30 big blind charts? They're coming. They got messed up the first time around. You didn't learn it all from one person. Turns out, yeah, you don't learn it all from one person. Yeah, if you're on Instagram, you couldn't see what I just did. On Instagram, they don't let me share my screen with you. Sorry, Instagram. You have to go to watch this show if you want the full experience at youtube.com slash poker coaching. Click on whatever's live and you'll be able to see it. Will there be a Black Friday sale? Hmm, that sounds like a good idea. How big of an edge do you think a modern day pro would have if they teleported back to 1985? I think they'd absolutely slaughter the games. <laughs> I don't think it would, even, it would even be close. It would be nowhere near close. It would not be fair at all. And um, that would be nice, wouldn't it? What do you think the highest maximum sustainable win rate is in one, two game? Well, I mean, it depends on how bad the players are, right? Let's suppose you're at a game where everybody bets all of their money besides $1 and then folds preflop every time. Somebody's really, really bad, right? Well, you're gonna win $900 per hand, right? So in theory, that's like the highest sustainable win rate is $900 per hand. But of course, that's ridiculous, right? So in reality, I don't know, 15 big blinds per hundred seems reasonable. No, I'm sorry, 15 big blinds per hour seems reasonable in live poker if your opponents are really soft and they play kind of fast. So um, 
you know, 30 bucks an hour at uh, two five, probably comparable. I know that I've played a lot of five ten live back in the day, at least. I mean, back in the day, probably five six years ago, and I was winning about 120 an hour. So I think 12 big blinds, 15 big blinds or so is reasonable. Where should you start studying if you play 1-3 live? Study the Cash Game Masterclass. It's in the courses section. If you're a Cash Game player, you've not watched the Cash Game Masterclass, you are making a big, big, big mistake. Make use of that content. It is great, and it's going to get you up to speed so you can crush the games. We have a tournament course coming up very, very soon. The end of November, I'm excited about that. I literally finished recording it yesterday. I have to go back and remake 10 parts that... I could have been a little bit more clear on, so that's good. We're doing lots of um, you know, user testing, making sure everything makes a lot of sense. And I'm excited that that is almost done. It's only taken me about a year. It's only about 30 hours long, so that's exciting. We want a nice long 30 hour long tournament course coming out in November. Maybe right around Black Friday time. Hmm, hmm. All right, I have to go. You think larger tournament backing and or cross deal should be disclosed and visible? I think that would be very, very hard to police. Um, should it be? Yes. Will it be? I don't know. Um, it's tough to police a lot of stuff. And should you have a rule that really only punishes or, you know, makes the, the good actors do the reporting, right? That's a tough thing. Like, this is why a lot of sites would allow you to use, um, things like hold a manager and whatnot for a long time. And a lot of them still do, right? Because policing that kind of thing is tough. Like, remember whenever World Series of Poker.com said you could not use heads up displays in um, Nevada, and then, like, some guy was streaming and he just, like, had a heads up display playing. And he, like, just forgot to turn off the setting that made it to where people couldn't see his heads up display. It's like, somehow he's getting heads up display stats, and uh, it's completely illegal, and uh, he's still doing it, right? Streaming it live for everybody. He got in a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> so it's like, if you can cheat, the bad actors will at least consider cheating, assuming the penalty is not detrimental a lot of the time, or assuming they're very likely, unlikely to get caught. Like we have this, you know, scandal of people using real-time solvers, which are explicitly illegal, yet the reward for using it for people who are good at poker is hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you get caught, eh, they confiscate your money and ban you, whatever, you know? So anyway, you got to be very careful in those scenarios. Um, anyway, that's going to be it for today. Hope you have a great day. Hope you enjoy it. <sighs> man, oh man, I'm tired. I have to get back to recording some more content for all of you. Have a great day. Make the most of it. It's Wednesday. Grind it out. We're halfway done with the week. Good luck in your games. Have a great time. Click like and subscribe. And if you like this book, please leave a review at Amazon. And if you haven't gotten the book yet, you're missing out. I'm telling you. I learned a lot making this book. If I'm learning a lot making this book, a lot of you are going to learn a lot from this book as well. It's excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. You can get it at pokercoaching.com slash tough. Have fun. Good luck. I'll talk to you next time.